I pray, you know, in my closet. I pray in the pool. I pray everywhere. Anything that you want God to do. If you're not feeling so good, God is a giver of joy. You can just say, Father, I just need the joy that comes from your presence. I need the joy that comes from your presence. I'm not in the mood to be happy. I want to be joyful. I need. I want to tap into your praises. I want to tap into your glory. I want to tap into all that you have for me. I need you, Lord, to do something great in my heart, in my life. And for what you're grateful for, for your sunshine, I want you to thank God. And say, Lord, I thank you. That, that happened to me. I thank you, Lord. I'm able to swear. I'm, I'm not afraid of water. It's amazing. Lord, thank you that the vacation is over. We're going back to school. I give you thanks for that. Thank you because Alma is going to be happy eventually for school that is resuming. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Well, I thank you, God. I bless your name. It's a new season, Lord. It's a new era for us. And I know that you're going to do something, something, something great. Blessed be your name forevermore. In Jesus' name, we are great. We're going to be taking Proverbs for today. Probably that the scripture. I just want to for some okay. I don't know if you can read this, but let's rise to our feet and just read the scripture for the day. Hebrews chapter 10, um, verse 16 to 27. Let's go. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of this, there is no longer any offering for sin, the full assurance of faith. Therefore, brothers, since we have the confidence to enter the body only place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the cotton, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts, sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to steer up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for saints, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversities. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Today, I want to talk about something that is very exciting to me. Where does God live? Where does God live? If you are able to answer this question, then you will understand who you are. If you don't know where God lives, you're likely not going to really know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, you have some kind of identity crisis. So you're going to live like any other person. You're going to do what people do because you don't know who you are. If you have an idea of where God is, Leaves. Now I know that if I ask the question, where does God leave? Maybe the children here will say, heaven. <coughs> where does it leave? Oh my God, you're so good. God, the Bible says his throne is in heaven. That's his throne, right? That's his palace. And the earth is his footstool. 
the Bible makes us to understand that it's omnipresent. That is everywhere. And so you want to know why, where is it, why is it not stationed somewhere? And I began um, a series called Covenants. The Bible said, God, we should gather together all the saints who have made covenant with God by sacrifice. Covenant is like an agreement or like a promise you make somebody. And you usually seal it with something. It's not like a contract, so to say, because contract has like a legal implication. But covenant is kind of spiritual. It has some spiritual implication. And so when God is working with people, he doesn't work on contract. Unfortunately, a lot of people love contracts. Why? You want to you want to bail out when you want to bail out. So you're always asking, so do I need to pay a fee or something? Just to bail out of this. Some people are contract staff, not because they want to be contract staff. But there's some people that actually choose to be contract staff because they want to do the things the way they want to do. They want to work when they want to work and they want to get out when they want to get out. But the truth of the matter is, if you own a company, will you allow a contract staff to have access to the company accounts? You don't want to do that because the contract Staff can just you know bail on you anytime. You want someone that is invested in the place. As a matter of fact, sometimes you want someone that you started the company with, someone that understands where you're coming from, and or someone that has a stake in the company. That's the kind of person you want to you know entrust with things that are very important and vital in the company. Now look at it like the way God wants to relate to us. The question is, if you, do you think God wants to walk with contract Christians? Do you think God will like someone that can bail whenever they want to bail or do whatever they want to do and say, you've got to order God. I, right now, I'm busy. When I finish what I've got to do, then we'll start talking about that thing you said but for now this is not what i want to do you don't want you don't want god if you can't do that god doesn't want to do that either god wants people who have made covenant with him by sacrifice the sacrifice is the lord jesus he wants people that can connect to him through the blood of christ so that when you're walking, you're thinking about the blood. When you're, when you're speaking, you're thinking about the blood. When you're acting, you're thinking about the blood. Why? Because what has connected you with God is that blood. And you don't want that blood to be shared in vain. And that took me uh, back to... That took me back to the tabernacle, the old tabernacle. I'm sure, I don't know if you've ever read about the tabernacle, you know, the, the tent of meeting. Now, in the Old Testament, there were, the tents were, I want to see if I can get a picture of the tent here. All right. That was the way it was, where they used to go meet God. Now it was divided into it's divided into two parts: the inner court and the outer court. Now the outer court, you have a kind of altar there, and you have like a laver where you wash your hands. Now in this outer court is when you know people would gather around this whole place. And they would come in with their lamb and their sheep and all this, you know, family by family, tribe by tribe. And so they will offer the sacrifice on that brazen altar here. So you will always see smoke going up from there. 
and then because of the blood and the mess and everything, the priest will now use this lather and wash their hands there. Now, after this is done, there is another place inside here. This place is divided into two parts. There is what they call the holy place, and the, the third part is called the holy of holies. Now, in this middle part, I want to see if I have some pictures here. In this middle part, you have like the altar of, uh, no, this is the brazen. I'm looking for the other part. All right, so you have this two parts here. There's a table here, and they have like bread on it. You, that, that table must never lack bread. Usually there are 12 of them, representing the 12, 12 tribes of Israel. But somebody will say, well, we're not Israelites. We've been grafted into, you know, that branch. When, when, they, when Jesus came and they rejected Jesus, the Gentiles had the opportunity of getting involved in, you know, the, the salvation program. Now, there is this table here, and there is this bread. They call it the shoe bread, or the bread of his presence. Now, we know that the bread represents Christ himself. It represents the word of God. It's the word of life, that the bread of life. And it's always on this table. And they keep any time this, this bread gets depleted, they replace it. There must always be bread in this place. There's also a candlestick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is always burning in that middle part. And this is where they usually end. The priests will be here, they'll be doing it. You know whatever they want to do now this place kind of represents your soul the outer court kind of represents your body and then the in the holy of holies represents your spirit man now why why i want i want you to be able to relate to it i'm trying to uh, explain it in the best way i can So, why did I say those courts represent you? See this old tabernacle. The Bible says you are the temple of God. So right now, you are the one that is housing the inner courts and the, the holy of holies. Now, this is here. This is you. This is your body, your flesh. Now, when you come to meet God, you can also look at this. This is what is casing you. The outer part is casing you. And then inside you, you have that your soul with your mind, your will, your emotions. They are in there. And then within you, you have the spirit man. And why I started by asking where does God live is you when you want to tap into God, you necessarily don't need to go to a place. You can actually get access God within you. Why we go to the house of God is it looks faster. Why? Because there are many people that, you know, that are bringing God's presence down. So you are easily, you know, you can easily access it faster. But you can actually tap into the inner place, you know, wherever you are. It just like, it might take a little bit more um, longer. But where I'm going is, now you have this outer place, and that outer place is where they're making the sacrifice. You come to God and you become born again. You come to God and you say, you know, I will sin no more. You come to God, you present your body a living sacrifice. Now what you're sacrificing there on that altar is you're just identifying with the blood with the death of Jesus and say, okay, I'm crucifying my flesh. Now, what goes away is the sin nature. You still have the work of the flesh. And that's why, you know, you can be born again and you still do certain things. 
You know, why? Because there's still a remnant, the same nature produces seven things in you that makes you do what you do. And that's why each time you come to God's presence, you go through that again and just say, God, I know you're not coming as a sinner because the sin has gone. What you're doing is you're coming to tell God, I need to get into that inner part. And whatever is stopping me, I want to kill it right now. And so when you go to God, whether you're praying or you're praising or your walk with God, this thing is still the same process. The outer court, the inner court, uh, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Everything you're doing in life goes through that pro uh, no, progression. There's always an outer court. There's always a um, you know, holy place, and there is holy of holies. I wanted to use something that you that all that you can I mean relate to. Now, for every relationship, there is an outer court. Boy meets girl. Friends, girl meet girl. You are the outer court. Now, most of the time, you don't plan the people in your life today, you didn't like pre predetermine. Yeah, where are they going to be that all the relationship you're going to have all the people if you think about everyone in your life prior to meeting them they were not nowhere in your mind prior to meeting them they were nowhere in your feelings prior to meeting them you didn't know they existed and so in the outer court you get to meet them and you introduce yourself to to them. Like when I met my husband, I met him in a on a school campus. I never knew anybody like that existed ever. But I I crossed over. I went outside the campus, just opposite you know the school. I wanted to just buy snacks or something. So I crossed over and there was this little, you know, corner store there and there were a few of them, you know, talking. All of a sudden, even though I didn't see the faces of the people, I knew that somebody stopped talking. I was hearing like three voices and one just disappeared and that caught my attention. Even though I wasn't looking at them. So I looked there and our eyes met and I just smiled and continued what I was doing. To start with, it comes from another tribe. I don't understand his language. He was just getting to learn my language. And by the way, I come from Nigeria where we have almost 500 languages. So you can imagine that there are some 400 people that come from Nigeria. I don't understand what he's saying. And so it, it makes me laugh when somebody says, you know what, I, I met a Nigerian somewhere and they tell me the name, like they're assuming I should know the person. I'm like, you, you, you have no idea how Nigeria is. I mean, it's even worse when somebody tells me somebody's from Ghana. I'm like, I'm not finished knowing Nigerians. You're talking about another country. It's not another state. And so meeting someone that doesn't understand your language kind of feels funny i mean i'm sure it's you're not it, it, that's not strange to you it's hard to date somebody that is not from your culture you know that love is not enough love at first sight is not enough there are many things you're going to get into when you get into the inner court now things happen in the outer court why relationships don't work is that people meet in the outer court and they want to run into the Holy of Holies. So it, it can't work because there are things, there's some exchange program that should happen in the outer court. There's some sacrifices that should be made in the outer court. There's some pre things. So you cannot imagine why God says, don't try to be unequally yoked. You, you won't be able to handle it. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Why? Because you do not have the same value system. If you want to take anybody into that inner court, 
you need to get things sorted out in the outer court. And that's why I say everything you do in life, spiritual or physical, always have that progression in your mind. There is an outer court. There is an inner court. There is a, that is a, a, a holy place and there is holy of holies where the real thing happens. If you want to look at it from like a, a, like a physical relationship, that's why you, I met my husband. Can you imagine me meeting him there? We just met. We are still outside. We're not yet in the, in the outer court because we're still outside the fence. I, even though I looked at him and I was like, there's something about this guy. I, don't, I didn't even know where he came from. Now, remember, I was not on campus. I went outside campus. And I met him somewhere that is opposite the campus. So he could have been coming from anywhere. So I just looked at him and I was like, okay, something happened there. But I continued what I was doing. I bought what I had to buy and I left. Few weeks later, I was writing an exam. And everybody was like tensed up in an exam hall. And then they said they were like coppers, they're like lecturer assistants. So we're coming in to invigilate the exam. And so while I was trying to get my groove on the exam paper, I felt somebody enter the class. I ran out. So I looked up and this is the person. So I continued what I was doing. The person came in again. I felt that somebody came in again, maybe the person that ran away, and that was him. Now he saw me and took off. Because he didn't expect to see me there. I'm really the first time he saw me, he didn't even know, he, of course, he didn't know who I was. He didn't know where I was coming from. He didn't know I was in the same department. No faculty is here because he was in electrical engineering. I was in civil engineering. And so he just came with his friends. One of his friends friend was the lecturer for that course. So the friend just said, oh, guys, you know, come and help me vigilate you know, these children. Only God knows what they're going to do. And they, so they came to catch people that were going to cheat. So when he came in and saw me, he was like, no, I, I can't stay here. We have not even talked. I don't know him from Adam. He doesn't know me. He doesn't know. But he just couldn't stay there because it was, I don't know what was going on with him. I also knew why is that guy going in and out? And then what he started doing is they were going around, he would come close to my, my seat and skip my seat and go and invigilate other people. Now, at that point, we are still in the outer court. Oh no, we have not even gone into the outer court. Eventually, when his friends realized there was something about this thing he was doing with me, the friend didn't say anything. The friend would help my, my exam sheet. So when they came to give everybody their papers, mine was missing. So I was like, what's going on? Where's my paper? And the guy said, he's not here. He should be in my office. Maybe he should come to my office. And so I followed him to the office. And that was my paper in front of, on, on, on the desk with somebody. And that was my husband. So I was like, my paper. Then he looked at it and said, oh, your name is so-so-so-so. Where are you from? And then we started talking. And before I know what was happening, I asked if I, was, I could play chess, because there was chairs on the table. I said, no, really. He said, let me teach you how to play chess. I went to collect my paper. Eventually, we started playing chess and things like that. And then he asked, you know, what I do. And I said, well, I'm in school here. And I now found out that, oh, it looks like you're interested because this is the third time we're meeting. And he said, oh, you noticed. I said, yeah, this is the third time we're meeting. Now, we met three times. We are still outside the outer court. We've not come into the inner court. Or we're not we come into the outer court. Now, it was time for us to really get to meet. And I'm saying this so you can know how the relationship, how relationships work including the one you have with God. There has to be an advancement. There has to be something that makes you want to take the person into the inner place, into the you know, Holy of Holies. 
If you run there with a person, you're going to run out. Because that would be too hot for you. And so we got talking and I quickly put it out there. I'm a born again Christian. He said, what's that? So I said, I explained it. I said, I received Christ into my heart. He said, oh, I'm also a Christian. I said, mm, not like that. I am actually committed to God. I won't do nothing that God wouldn't be proud of. Not even with you. I won't do that. So he said, oh, that's interesting. He's never seen somebody like that. He now called me, he said, I'm not SU. We used to call some, you know, other Christians, SU, people that tie their head and things like that. And I said, I don't know what that is. I just don't have a relationship with God. And first thing first, we still say that till tomorrow. Anytime he's talking to me, we tell the first thing first. So because that was the, all I kept saying. First thing first, you need to get yourself together before you get any, with any other person. I won't get with you if you are not rooted and grounded in God. And so I started talking about what it means to be rooted in God. And he said, okay, what do I have to do? I said, come to church or something. It was like, just like that. I said, mm, come. And he did come. And then there was a concert. At some point, I told him to come for the concert. He came to the concert. I saw him, but he didn't see me. And so when there was an altar call, he went out and received Christ into his you know, life. That wasn't still enough for me because he was now in the outer court. And there is no way someone in the outer court, because this time is just getting himself on the altar. This time around is just getting cleansed. This time around is just get he has not started knowing why. Because the holy place is where you have the word, is where you have the bread, is where you have the the the, the light. And the Bible says, Thy word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet, and a light to my path. That's where it is. Being in the outer court, that's why I love when somebody says to me, you know, I think he's a Christian, I think he knows God, I'm like, mm, outer court? It doesn't work that way. That person is in the outer court. The person is not yet in the holy place. The person is still on the flesh level. He's still probably doing the do's, like, you know, the person goes to church, the person says some Christian things, the person plays Christian music in their car. It's amazing how people jump into conclusion that people, some people are really Christians because they've gone into their car and they were listening to worship music. People listen, everybody listens to worship music. If they like it, they will. They are in the outer court. It doesn't work because they don't really know themselves yet. They have not tapped into the inner place where God sits. They have God down there, but they have not reached that place. And that's why some people also, even when they now get into you know, the, 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 the inner place, the first part of the inner place, which is called the holy place, that time is when you begin to kind of you know, tie your souls together. You start exchanging ideas. You want to know, okay, so, you know, what do you do? How do you think about certain things? What are your values? And, you know, you know, what are things that will get you upset? Because right there is where you have your mind, you have your will, you have your emotions. That's where you want to know, okay, so what's this person doing? And in terms of God, that's when God begins to reach out to your intellect. God begins to reach out to your emotions. That's when you begin to grow the fruit of the Spirit. You're still walking with God at this point. Now, that's when you begin to eat of that shoe bread, you know, every day. The Bible says that they always have the supplies on a daily basis. That's where you, you, you stay in God's presence. You stay, you know, in the presence of His candle. That is, you've not yet gotten into that place. And so when people tell me that, you know what, what do you mean if you, if you date a Christian, what are all those people in churches that are doing that? They are in the holy place. They are not. They've not breached the holy of holies. They're not broken yet. 
they have not gotten there. They, you see them say the word, they can quote scriptures and do certain things. In fact, they may even have, they may be slow to speak, quick to hear, slow to anger, but they have not yet gotten deep, deep down. They, they can't access God the way he hears. Yeah. God comes out and, you know, dwells with them and does everything. But they have not gotten to a place where he lives. And until you get into my bedroom and you're comfortable in my bedroom, you really don't know me yet. There are seven friends you have they can get into your bedroom. They even know, you know, your closet. They can use your bathroom and things like that. That's when you can say, oh, we're close. Because you can, there are people you know, you like them, but even if you're close to them, they're not close to you that much. Maybe you can drive their car and that's the way it ends. But they can't be driving and rush, you know, maybe they're around your house and they didn't tell you they were coming. They say you want to use the bathroom. And they press on your bell and roll that in and things like that. No. Now, where am I going? We're talking about you having covenants with God. You having that kind of relationship with God that nobody can come in between. You know, if, if things are not working well for you, you're not blaming God. You just know that God is up to something. I know God is up to something. Because you know him too well he knows you too well because covenant is actually all i have is yours and all i am is yours and all you have is also mine you come to that point and so if you're in a relationship with someone that has not come to that point that's what i'm going to say no you are still unequally yoked because the person is not yet broken and like i said after the old thing you know we started my husband came started coming to church and I was seeing him and things like that. I still knew he was still between the outer court and the holy place. I knew he had not gotten there yet. I knew he, he wasn't there yet. So he asked me one day, he said, I, I'm not born again. I said, yes. There's something they call foundation of faith classes. He said, I'm in class. I said, I'm in faith like 9 or 11. Every week. You can't miss it. Start coming. So he started going. That was a shoe brand for him. Every week he will go, he will see me in school and say, ah, it was interesting yesterday. They talked about, you know, they're talking about the book of Romans. And he will tell me one or two things there. Of course, I'll get impressed. Man, I have a convert now that is even growing. But that was it. I wasn't interested in any other thing yet because I needed him to get there. If not, if I'm already in there, it's like you going up and somebody is coming behind you. If the person, if you try to hold the person, the person is more likely to pull you down than you are pulling the person up. So I wouldn't dare do that. That's why the Bible says two shall become one. A whole one and a whole one. I want people in the inner place, in the Holy of Holies to come together. That is when the threefold cord is not quickly broken. But if one is in the outer and you are in the inner, there's going to be a problem. Because you don't understand, the person has, cannot reach out to himself. The person cannot get to a point where there's something is wrong with the relationship and the person feels God inside and says, I think something is wrong. You, what you guys were doing is you'll be talking and be operating in the soulish realm. You'll be expressing, you'll be talking about your emotions. And things like that. At that point, I just knew uh -uh, we couldn't yet connect. For seven months, even though we started going to the same church, he did not even know where I lived. And I didn't know where he lived. We met the church. And we're just talking about, you know, his growth, not me. We're just, because I was more interested in him getting to that place. And that's something about the relationship. I tell people, don't be too concerned about the person getting into you. Be concerned about the person getting into God. Because if the person gets into God, you're secure. It'll be easy for you to deal with the person. As long as you yourself, you're getting deeper, you're moving into the Holy of Holies, you know, on a daily basis. Now, we started talking and 
you know, after he got he got through his um, foundation of faith classes, he told me, he said, ah, tomorrow I am finishing my foundation of faith. I said, congratulations, that's good. I asked him, I said, so what group are you joining in church? So it was like, I'm supposed to join the group. I said, well, you have to, you have to become responsible because the place is now your house. I don't want you to come to church thinking you're going to see me. I want you to come to church knowing you're coming to serve because you need to have a community as well. You need to see the place as yours. And so he said, so what do you think? I said, you can't sing, you can't do anything. So <laughs> I don't know what else you do, but being an usher or something. Now, I wanted the ushering thing because at that time, my church, the ushers were the hottest when it comes to spirituality. They would come earlier than anybody and they would come to pray. And they leave later than everybody because they pray as well. I didn't understand why they were doing the praying before and praying after, but that was what was going on with them. Another thing is, they are very conspicuous in church. Even though it's a big church, you, you can't miss them because they stand in places. So if you're misbehaving, somebody must catch you somewhere. And my church was hot. You come to church sometimes, and when they come with seven scriptures, you know that they want to out somebody. They will call you on, on the altar. Like you're sleeping with somebody or something, they'll call both of you out. You will, you, will, you will apologize to the whole church because they'll, they'll tell you messing the whole church up. And the Bible says, because we are all needed spiritually, when something is wrong with the hand, something is wrong with the head as well. And so when you belong to a body and you're not living up to that, you're messing the whole body up. And they were very... Even though it was a church that you would never believe they'll do stuff like that there because the pastor and the and the wife, you know, they speak American accent and things like that, but they don't joke. They don't mess around, we say, in the church. And there were professors also, you know, at the campus there. And so we had they had a lot of college students in church. And it was so, it was, they, that church gave me the kind of background that I have now because they were not messing around. They didn't just let people do, it was a big church, but it, we, it, it felt like a small village because we had this small, small group and people were into each other so much that it was difficult for you not to grow as a Christian. You know, they will help you spiritually, they'll pray with you and do stuff like that with you. And so I just told my husband, I said, you know what? Usher, ushering is the best for you. You have to be an usher. And it was like, okay. He didn't understand what that usher was about. One, he have to, he will, he will get to church before me. Two, I will leave there before him. So it was a bit frustrating for him. But at this point, we're not even talking about dating. We're not talking about, because he had not gotten to that point. One day he just told me, he said, I want to travel. I said, where are you going? He said, I just want to stay, go somewhere and be with God. That was when I knew. He has gotten there. For somebody to just say, I want to go somewhere and be with God, not with friends. I want to go somewhere and be with God. I knew there was a breakthrough. I knew the veil had turned over. I knew he could now see himself with it. You see when people are worshiping God, some people are looking around. Some people are crying. Why? Because some people have gotten to that place. They can feel God. They're in that presence at that moment. There's some people that are still in. Some people don't even get into the outer in an outer court. They're just around the fence. You know, they're like, that's when you get self-conscious. That's when you get, you know, conscious of your environment. That's when your body, your flesh is acting out. Because you, you can't get, you're frustrated, you can't get inside. And so you're restless. And you're doing all manner of stuff. That's why it's hard that you can't even, you, you're hearing the word of God, you're listening to the word of God, but you're not hearing it. If after the, that night, they ask you, what was the scripture? You can't remember why you were just battling in the outer court at that point. So you are not in there. And it's hard for someone that does not know how to get in there to have life of fellowship outside church. 
where you you can you know you can do you can see god on the road you can see god everywhere you go and it, it becomes difficult for you to be depressed you you just you can just tap in into that inner place because you you are no longer dealing with all these little little things and that's what the bible says the scripture we read today he said the covenant i will make with them will be a covenant whereby I will write my law of their heart. And nobody will have to teach them what to do. They, they will know this is right and they will know this is wrong. And they will not struggle with doing it or, you know, or not doing it. That is a level where a relationship you know, gets to a point where you can now get into the bedroom and you're not thinking about who is watching you, you can just undress. It takes time to get there. And that's why it's amazing where people can be in the outer court and undress. Without even going to the inner place. So that part now leaves you with like guilt and shame because that's where those things should die first guilt shame blame and that's why it doesn't last because it's hard for you to get to that point where there's even a covenant and if there's no covenant yet it's the thing is shaky it will break very soon because you didn't go through the process you didn't go through the shoe brain and the candlestick and then you want to do what it should be done in the inner place, you want to do it in the outer court. It will never work. In anything that we are doing, whether you're praying, when you want to pray, most of the time what we want to pray, we start in the flesh. I mean, you close your eyes, you still are, you're still doing one or two things. You may never get into that place. You may not have all that breakthrough that, okay, God heard me. If you don't walk yourself into the inner place and then into the holy of holies where you can now really get the manna you can get your breakthrough because in the inner place that's where you see you know there is this ark of covenant which represents the presence of god you have that's where you have the aaron's rod that bought it and that's where you have the manna inside the you know the box for you to be able to get into God and really enjoy your Christian life, you have to get there. You have to be intentional about getting into the place. Your worshiping God will start by just singing. And then we get to a level where you can actually now hear God. There's an exchange program. And then you get to a place where you even forget where you are. It is not just singing at this point. You can feel that you're worshiping God. Christianity gets boring if you don't get there. It feels tedious if you don't get there. It feels like, should I go? Is it not going to be like last week if you don't get there? And so, one thing that God kept me awake for this night is to tell you this and to help you to get there. That information is available, but telling you is not enough for you to get there. You need to be aware that there's a place and you need to know that God lives right within. It stays inside. There's a place inside of you. There's your core muscle. Um, I was listening to a woman of God. She said everything... You know, she started having like headache, her hands are like aching her, her legs were hurting, and she said she freaked out. She was like, why is everything falling apart? And she went to the doctor, and they told her, no, it's not a medical thing, that she needed to go to the gym. And her, she got an instructor, and the instructor said, they need to start working on her core. If you go to the gym, and you don't really know, you're not strengthening your core, and you're not likely to be able to do nothing there. So what they try to get you to strain first is your core muscle. Because that's what is holding everything together. Spiritually, your core muscle is your spirit man. And you need to 
concentrate on that spirit man, you know, so the spirit man can now help your body, it can help your soul. It can help your emotions. You're not up and down. You're not like depressed today, excited tomorrow, and then you're thinking, you know, you're, you're pessimistic today, and then you're optimistic tomorrow. You're not up and down. It helps you, it keeps you, it gives you discernment spirit. If I go to a place, I can discern spirits there. There are people that are, are, God just tells me, be careful. Why? Because I can easily tap into that core. I can easily tap into God. You know, somebody said, you know, you, people keep saying God speaks to them. How does God speak to you? I said, within you. Why? That's where he lives. Within you. I said, but the fact that he lives there does not mean you can access him. It's, it's within you, but you need to be able to get in there. Like the fact that me and my husband, when I started talking, does not, I mean, we got married, but we may not have married because there were a lot of people I left in the outer courts because I met other people apart from him. But what made us get together eventually was I was moving toward God who was moving toward God. And so it was easy because I already experienced what it means to be in God's presence. I've already known what it means not to see. I wasn't. I was no longer, you know, doubting whether I should marry an unbeliever or I should marry a believer. I was no longer in that zone. It was not. You can't be attractive to me if you're not in the Holy of Holies. You can't. Everything, every word that comes out of your mouth sounds funny in my ears. I'll be smiling, I'll not judge you, I'll just be smiling. When you're talking, I'll just be, in my mind, I'm shaking my head and saying, God, you need God. And so, when you're talking to me, I'll be taking the conversation to God. Because at that point, I'm, I'm thinking, it's not me you need now. You need God. You need to get it together. You need to access that God inside your, your, your body. You need to be able to commune with Him. And it's so amazing that's why it's so easy when you have God within you to just ask. That's the why you're yet speaking, I will hear you. you. You're just able to know certain things. I'm going to some places sometimes. I'm driving and I look left and right and I discover where am I supposed to turn now? And God just tells me, right. And I just go. And I'm smiling. Sometimes it feels like you're crazy. But because you have something, see, when I watch certain animations, I see they have an idea of what this is about. They, they have that idea. It's just that I know it's God inspiring them to do certain things. I'm like, these people are talking about the inner place. They're talking about the Holy of Holies. You know, they're able to, but I will say, you know, supernatural. This person has, you know, a superhero gift and things like that. That is what it is. Because once you're able to tap into, you act like a superhero. People kind of think you're different because you, you're operating in all these gifts, which is coming from within you. And fortunately, everybody can be in that position. You just need to be able to move from the outer court, the flesh level, and you can move now into the inner place where you stay in God's presence much more and you stay on the word of God and so you can move into the holy place where God's presence is. Where in your Christian walk, when you're worshiping in relationship. I kind of like to tie things to relationships since that's what I do mainly. And it's kind of just easy for me sometimes when I tell people in my my, my, my therapy room that it, the, you, you guys are not having like a real problem that I can solve. You both just need to get into a place where your time you can actually dance tango. Because as long as one person is in the holy place and the other person is the holy of holies, when they're they're dancing. Sometimes when the first person puts the left leg forward, the other person also puts the left leg of the right leg forward and then they kind of 
they, they, they kind of step on each other's toes. Why? Because there is no rhythm to their dance. Until you are in that place where you, are, you, are, you can actually be able to dance well and tango well, you will keep stepping on each other's toes. Now, there are people that are in the holy place. Most people, like some people in the church, they're in the holy place that they, they, they speak the word, um, they, 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 they God's praises most of the time. But you still find that there are issues there. There are issues there because there's a place to get to that they have not gotten to. And so people will be wondering, they're going in church, why are they having problems? Why are they divorces in church? Because a lot of people are in the holy place. They are not in the holy of holies where they are making covenant with God and they are sold out. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you offer yourself a living sacrifice. That is say you are alive but you are dead. Now you get to that point where you begin to walk in the fruit of spirit effortlessly. That is say when people offend you, you do not even have the capability to be angry. You want to be angry, you know, you're, you just know I'm supposed to be angry. Why am I not angry? You, you don't know why. Because you've gotten there. You just get to a point where you cannot react. It comes to a point where, see, you can't say you're a Christian and it's so easy to use all the F words it just means you've not gotten there. You've not gotten to that place where it becomes difficult for you to say things that are not glorifying to God. You've not gotten to a place. I can't, I tell people, even if I feel like, if I want to go to certain places, I don't have the capability to go. Even if you put me in a car, I will be there. People may be laughing there, but I will be very miserable there. There are certain things I cannot there's a lot of people I cannot relate to. I can preach to them, but they can't be my friends. Because they're out there and I'm in the holy place. It's hard for you to be in the holy place and be seeing people in the outer courts. It's very hard. And if you meet somebody that is in that holy place, and you're both in the holy place, you're both sold out to God. It's hard for there to be issues. It's hard because you're both broken. You're, you're working the supernatural together. It's, you're no longer about each other. You're about the kingdom. You're both thinking about how to progress in the kingdom. You're both thinking about how to help people to get into the holy place. And so you don't have that time to begin to bicker. The only time I started having issues with in my marriage was when I started stepping out of the Holy of Holies. I didn't go into the outer court, but I was in a, in a holy place. But I was no longer in that part. Now I started dealing with emotions. I started dealing with all manner of stuff. The things I didn't know were there, I started, I started battling with things I shouldn't battle with. And then, because I was there and we were already joined together, my husband also stepped out. And so, every talk was always, you made me feel like this. You make me, you know, that's what we do therapy. You, when you do this, you make me feel. When they, our feeling became so important to us that our spirit man went and sat down. And then until we now say, what is going on here? Why are we seeing ourselves more than we see God? Because you're supposed to see God more than you see the other person. Even though you're looking at the person, you're seeing God in that person. And so you're respecting the person. Not as a person, but as someone that is born and bought by the blood of the Lamb. You, you can't disrespect someone. You know, just like you can't disrespect your pastor. Can you imagine you, you seeing a pastor in your spouse? You, it's just difficult. And if it's vice versa, the person cannot disrespect you. The person can't say things like, oh, get out. Oh, you're stupid. You, it, it, it becomes impossible. My son told me one day, he said, somebody called somebody stupid and then encouraged. He said, is that asking him, why that? I said, because it's not a familiar thing. 
because you don't hear them in the house. You can't you can do that. He said anytime they take him to a club, he's a nuisance there because he puts his head down and sleeps. And then they tell him, go home. Because that's not a familiar thing for him. He doesn't know how to do that. He's never seen a bear in the fridge all his life. Why were we able to sustain that? Because we got together in the holy place, only of holies. So the house was just naturally the word. We wake up in the morning, it became normal for us to just wake up in the morning, everybody gathers in the living room and we pray together. When there is something to celebrate, we celebrate together. We mourn with those that mourn together. Our friends were family of the whole you know, family. If I know somebody, my kids know them and they know their children and things like that. And we only connected on that level. Now, that doesn't mean that we're always consistent like that. But each time things don't fall apart is because we stepped out, not because somebody became bad. We stepped out from where we're supposed to be and then we started having issues. We still go back and forth, back and forth because everybody is growing now and people are beginning to, you know, my children are not doing things because I told them to do them anymore. Everybody's trying to discover themselves. What am I supposed to, because it's always good for you to find that place yourself. If anybody takes you to the holy place, you're not likely to stay there. You need to be able to desire it and find yourself going into that place. Amen. Any question? Okay. Do we understand this thing? The progression? The outer court, inner court, uh, the holy place and the holy of holies. In everything you're doing, you want to go into prayer, know that you're starting first from the outer court. So get rid of all the things. You know, go to God, telling God, I'm sorry. You know, try to reflect on yourself and say, I, I didn't do what I'm supposed to do. And just confess the ones you remember and say, God is able to forgive me and cleanse me from every righteousness. And then worship God, get into and begin to sacrifice, give him sacrifice of praise and get into that place. You know, like, don't do it while you're doing some other stuff. If it's a time with God, let it be a time with God. So you can actually get in there. And, you know, stay on the word. Also, let there be a word that you have in your mouth. That means we should present back to him his word. You know, when you're talking with God, don't use your own language. Use the language you understand. It's a word. Don't just go and start, you know, speaking gibberish there. He, he understands the word. The word. That's what he understands. So that's why I always say, please stay on the word every day so you can have something in your spirit so God can be able to relate. The table must always have a shoe bread, must always have the word. And then stay in his presence and pray so he can now take you into, because the high priest is the only one that enters into the Holy of Holies. And so Jesus can take you in there. All this thing is you going from like your soul and you're going down into your spirit. You're still in the same place. And I think most people don't understand Christianity because they're just thinking that, you know, oh, oh, well, we're going up there. When you tell some people, close your eyes, they're imagining heaven. No, he's right within you. And you can tap into him if you want to and if you believe him because there's an aspect of faith. My husband and I now, we've been together for uh, over 32 years. And that's the only thing that could have kept us that long. Because a lot of things have happened. You know, job has taken him to several places. I'm here in the United States, it's in Nigeria. But what could have kept us together is not us keeping ourselves together. It's God. Because he's doing God there. I'm doing God here. And so, even if we don't talk about God together, we have a relationship. We're trying to maintain being in the Holy of Holies. It's trying to maintain being in the Holy of Holies. And so, as long as we keep meeting in that place, we are together. We are together. And so, if you've not found somebody, have that in mind. And if you're ready with somebody that is not in the Holy Place, keep praying for the person. God, keep, take that person there. You know, do whatever it takes. Stop making people love you. 
make people love God, then it will be easy. And for you to have to keep moving there, because if you now meet in that room, that is where the covenant is made. Marriage is not coming to the altar and the pastor pray for you. Marriage is both of you getting into the inner place and God knitting both of you together. You don't need a ceremony to do that. You don't need to wear a gown to do that. You just need to get into that room and then God unites you. Of course, it's good for people to celebrate and witness what has happened, but that is not the most important thing. The most important thing is you people getting into the Holy of Holies. Holy. Because if you do what you're supposed to be doing, the Holy of Holies, if you start, you know, you start, you know, sleeping together in that outer court, you may never be able to get in there. Because that will always withhold you from getting there. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We give you praise, glory, and honor for your word. We thank you, Lord, because we shall be doers of your word and not hear us only deceiving ourselves. Lord, I've delivered your word to your people today. And just ask Holy Spirit that you will breathe upon this word, making them the doers of this word and not hear us only. Help them to grow dear by, O oh God, Jehovah. Father, Lord, help them to be able to navigate from this outer court to the holy place and to the inner place, O oh God, the holy of holies, Lord. Help them to, to find you, Lord, Father. Lord, help them to have this relationship with you, O oh God. Lord, help them, O oh God, Lord, to enjoy fellowship with you and with the brethren in the mighty name of Jesus. Blessed be your name forevermore because we have prayed in Jesus' name.